give me a hand in or 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 mention something in the chat if you've ever won a deal or made major impact on an opportunity then saw the celebration of that opportunity maybe it's in the win wire on slack maybe it's in an email or at a sales kickoff and your name was not included who's ever been there as a pre-sales engineer yeah ouch yep right here we've all been there right i'll raise my hand too you're the one who closed it. Tulsi, love it. See you on there too. Now, pre-sales is powerful because we live in the gray area, right? So much of that, even Shamil Turner last night from Figma said at dinner, we should have a drink every time we say the word gray area. And then we decided not to because for obvious reasons, I wouldn't be here today. We influence product, sales, the entire organization. This also creates one of the largest challenges in our profession, which is value primarily the proof of value and the influence we have over the organization. I have a saying that we know more about sales than product and more about product than sales. Okay. You can insert this sentence into almost every single part of the organization and it just works, right? We know about more about marketing than product and we know more about product than marketing, right? Where are the flywheel of go to market and really the entire organization. The challenge I've seen across many organizations I've worked at a problem that has been present in the hundreds of conversations I've had with pre-sales leaders in my role as a general manager of Pre-Sales Collective is how to prove value, how to expand influence, and that's what the maturity model discussion is about. For those of you don't, who don't know me, my name is Chris Mabry. I've been in tech for 25 years. I started in uh, customer service at the ripe age of 17 at a startup. I currently run Pre-Sales Collective as a general manager. This is really a story of evolution broken into two parts. It's the evolution of what's possible for a solution organization's growth. Um, as we go through the process, you're actually going to find yourself likely in the middle of like different tiers of maturity. Okay. You might find yourself um, mature in one area, but not in the other, et cetera. It's really a framework for how to influence and get things done in your organization. So this is, uh, also taken directly from some experience I've had and, and a couple of the uh, pre-sales engineers that are on the call with us actually went through this with me, my last organization at Datto. So the second part is basically taking a two-year real-world example, breaking down how we did it and how we expanded our influence over the organization. Okay, so let's jump in the first segment, which is all about defining the stages of maturity, then we'll jump into the real-world situation uh, where we applied the methodology and we put it to the test. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen with you. And in the chat, let me know if you can see it. We're good. All right. Evolution of a pre sales team. It's space themed because we are here to reimagine things, right? So, intro to the pre sales model, lessons from the field, two years of branding. The pre-sales maturity model, it's literally a framework. As I discussed, it provides guidance on how to improve or go up the chain of maturity. We've identified five stages of maturity within an organization, okay? Stage number one is resource. This is a heavily manual, inconsistent, sort of highly adaptable, but really no process and tools kind of, kind of organization. When I last joined my, uh, when I joined my last company, you know, we were doing like white gloves and walkthroughs. Okay. We were a very, we were seen and perceived as a resource. Um, and we were kind of getting into collaborator stage, which is where you're using some tools, you're documenting your processes, you're starting to define terms. There's still a lot of inconsistencies on how, get, how things get done. Um, but you're getting there. The third stage is what I call the trusted advisor stage. This is where we're actually measuring stuff. So processes are widely adopted. There's a lot of tools. We're using, we're using some technology now. Onboarding, like onboarding new SEs, onboarding sales teams, it's still pretty inconsistent, but it's happening and training is very inconsistent. It's maybe one of those, hey, we're gonna do something at SKO for our team, right? The stage four, go-to-market and product influencer. This is where I think of us being actually like influencing the organization. So all of our processes are, are becoming streamlined. We have tools for efficiency. We have effective training. And then stage five, which is really, I think the gold standard, it's revenue and industry leader. So this is where you're actually aligned. You're 
driving the organization forward. You're seen as a, uh, as a go-to-market expert. Now we're going to go into each stage and talk about how, basically like talk about the roles and responsibilities. And then we're going to talk about the perception of influence. So we obviously do a lot. It's just, how does the other, how does the rest of the organization perceive us? Okay. So the roles and responsibilities of a resource, this is like you're maintaining basic product knowledge. You're leveraging detailed knowledge from past experience. Maybe you have a team of people who were out in the field working on this tech in real life. Um, and they have that kind of experience, but they're just kind of getting into the process of actually maybe selling it or being a proficient at it at this level. You're responding to clients' inquiries, but without really a structured approach. You, you don't have like a process in which you respond to great like inbound. Sales is really seeing you as a tool because you're doing reactive support. Like they're going to come to you and say, we need a demo and you're going to do a demo. You're doing ad hoc technical support. Uh, you're doing really like sales lifecycle stuff only when it's explicitly asked of you. That's the role and responsibility. That's kind of like stage, right? Now, the challenge with this is that the perception in the organization is that you are viewed as a reactive support team. You are viewed as a tool. And oftentimes in this stage, and I've experienced this firsthand, uh, you, you're not going to get any budget because basically the organization sees you as a technical tool who comes in um, when, 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 you know, you basically need to show the product. Okay. You have minimal impact on product development or strategy. Likely you're just getting product development updates coming to you. Maybe they're even hitting your demo environment and you wake up in the morning and you're like, Hey, what's this? Oh, we just released a product today. We've all been there. Um, your efforts are kind of seen as being sporadic and uncoordinated. You have limited collaboration. So uh, maybe this is even within the same team, not even, not even cross uh, cross organizational collaboration. So you're just overall perceived as having a limited role. The good news here is there's only one direction and that is up. Okay. <laughs> so this isn't that bad. I've actually been at multiple organizations where this is the case. The goal is to get to the next stage, which is to be seen as a collaborator. You got the little space guys collaborating here. You know, they're talking. Your responsibilities change a little bit because you're collaborating more often within the team. Think of it as like building the internal glue within your SE organization. You're analyzing client needs with discovery. So you're, you're actually doing some proper discovery. Maybe you've got some discovery training. Um, we're no longer doing white gloves. We're engaging proactively with clients. So there might be some proactive, like post demo client engagement, you know? Hey, just checking in with you. Last week, we, we, we showed you XYZ product and you discussed this need. Uh, how's it going, right? So you're, you're, you're engaging proactively. You start specializing in roles. So specialization, verticalization, we're all comfortable with the fact that as your, as your team grows, you have to specialize, you have to, uh, you have to verticalize. So you start doing that. And the team is getting a lot better at product. That's the responsibility. Now, in this perception side of it, you're kind of viewed as playing a supportive role in the sales process. You're still supporting sales, not driving sales. That's key. You have influence on product development and strategy. Maybe you, you're, you're influencing a bit more of the roadmap. Your efforts are seen as more collaborative. So it's important that basically it, it looks, you know, uh, it looks collaborative and, and official. Roles and responsibilities are becoming more defined. So you're actually doing like career model frameworking um, where roles and responsibilities are more clear. You know, you, uh, your team understands what they're supposed to do. And you're perceived as having more of a proactive approach in client engagement. That's key. And, I, and I'll get into the perception of proactive client approach. Uh, those, those, those individuals who are on here who were on my team uh, were so tired of the word proactive and I don't blame them. The third stage is trusted advisor. All right, so now you are the, you're the CTO to the CEO of the sales team. You're developing and maintaining comprehensive portfolio product knowledge, right? So, so, so now you're like deep within the portfolio. You're implementing customer-centric approaches with deep understandings of your, of your uh, target market, your ICP, you understand your ICP better. You're tailoring solutions specific to their needs. 
Um, so they have specific requirements. So you're tailoring your demo environments. Maybe you've got a tool that's giving you some data that makes it look like you understand them a lot better. You're starting to affect the entire sales cycle. This is influence over ownership. I want to be very clear. This isn't, you're not owning post sales, but you're influencing post sales. You're influencing top of funnel. You're influencing lead gen. Performing efficient handoffs during the sales process. So every time you throw that ball over the fence to the next department, there's something lost, right? People need to be using the same words. And something I see a lot, which is like the, the pre-sales to post-sales uh, transition is tough because they're not using the same words. Or every time you throw that ball over the fence, there's some loss of trust with the client. You're doing, you're doing that better. And you're fulfilling some well-defined roles and specializations, okay? So we're getting really good here. And internally, you're seen as like an indispensable part of the sales process. Like without the pre-sales team, we know we are not hitting our number, right? Not like we're not doing demos. We're not hitting our number. We're not hitting our revenue targets. You're recognized as having significant influence on product. Again, we know more about product than a lot of other organizations. We're now leveraging that knowledge backwards. You're seen as being super collaborative, strong internal relationships with other organizations. You're acknowledged for these specialized expertise in the sales and solution process. You're basically becoming that trusted advisor, right? It's what, what we all want to do. Stage four, go to market and product influencer. Okay, this is somebody, this guy's driving the spaceship. He's influencing the uh, course of the, of the space travel. This is where you're establishing like SMEs. So you've got like SMEs in product, industry, solution demands. You're, you're starting to like influence the market. Okay, you're designing and tailoring solutions that consistently ex exceed the client expectations. Um, now, old school way we would do this with just our demo environments. There's a lot of ways you can expedite this, right? Uh, but you're basically blowing it out of the water every time, right? You're proactively driving sales growth. Maybe you're involved in forecasting meetings. You're involved in QBRs. You're, uh, you've got a drop down in Salesforce that says, I think this is a technical win, right? And your forecast is almost even... What I would say is almost closer than the sales forecast. I'm seeing that in other examples. You're actually continuously improving the sales cycle process. You're participating in all the internal expertise networks. Maybe you're joining events like this one today and you're learning from everybody else. I saw everybody sharing their LinkedIn's. I think that's wonderful. Uh, if you haven't used this opportunity to grow your network and grow your expertise in your field, look, you already showed up, make the most of it, right? Start to connect with people you really care about. You're collaboratively, uh, you're collaborating effectively across teams. So you're driving innovation in marketing, you're driving innovation in sales and product and beyond. Now, the perception part is really important here because this as a leader is where you get budget, right? You're recognized as a key enabler to accelerate the sales growth. So we know when we have an SE on the deal, there's, the, there's data out there, like 40% more deals close when there's an SE attached to it. I see that a lot. Um, we know when you get an SE attached to an opportunity, it closes faster, better, stronger, right? Um, your, your, your strategic influence on product marketing strategies, by far, you're seen as a driving force of innovation. Um, and essentially, you're, you're like creating great sales processes, right? Now, this is the revenue and industry leader. This is like where we would all love to be, where you're just leading innovation, right? You're, you're, you're developing new products. You put yourself on product launches. You're educating the market. Maybe you're telling the CEO what product we should come out with next. You have leadership roles for cross-functional coordination and you're a strategic partner in shaping pretty much everything. Uh, go to market mostly. The perception through the roof, right? You're, you're, you're valued and seen as a key partner in executing business strategy, market strategy, and you have the ear of the CTO, the CEO, and they're getting insights from you. Okay, so those are the five stages. Again, we have resource collaborator, trusted advisor, product and influencer, and revenue and industry leader. Who here finds themselves in between these things? I, I haven't been checking out the chat I love, that. thank you for putting your LinkedIn in there and connect with me as well. Chris White, I love that you put that on there. Um, the, I, I, I would love to answer Q&A, so we'll get to that in a moment. Um, big on verticalization, that's where maturity starts. Yeah, super huge there. Um, Jeff, you're right on. Jeff was at Data when we did this. 
So thank you for all the comments. Please letting us know. Yeah, you're in between three and four, 3.5 according to your guys. Love that. Um, I would say most people who are interested in the craft of pre-sales is like you're two, three, or four, you're right in between. So thank you so much for the comments. Now we're going to get into the how. I'm going to do a quick time check to make sure I'm good. I want to get into like, okay, that, that sounds great. That's a model. It's a, it's a framework. Um, let's get into lessons for the field. So how did we, how, how did we do this at my last organization? And maybe I'll steal some, steal some examples from other people who have shared with me. So in 2021, we set off to transform pre-sales from a tech org to a revenue organization. Okay. We needed to secure budget. Our, our executives basically told us, um, and this is where I, I got into SE leadership at this organization. And I learned really quickly that you couldn't just go to the CRO and say, I need, uh, I need more headcount because the workload is too high. What you have to do is say, I need more headcount because I'm going to influence revenue. Right. And we had to go through this process because we were kind of a fast growing company with an amazing product with a maturity level that wasn't really there. So there's me and that's my son, Thomas. We had these cool offices where we had these big backgrounds and there's the Datto logo. He's much older now. Um, I'm gonna walk you through year one and year two. What we did is we branded the year. Okay, so brands and signaling is important. Uh, signaling is everything. If you think of career model frameworks, titles, things like that, you need to signal to people that you're actually on a mission, that you're doing something. So brand your year, give your, give your year a brand, identify where you can make meaningful change, like real change, not just, you know, sort of sit on the call. Uh, one thing we did that I would recommend is create councils, walk through that process, unify your tech. Um, if you are the only organization doing demonstrations, which we were, uh, the, our sales team could not demo any products. Um, you need to basically enable that. Okay, so brand the year. The first year we did this, we call it the year of the SE. Transformative and proactive year. So we wanted to make sure that we all understood this was the year. Of, it was our year, you know, and it was the, it, it, there was a plan behind it. Okay. When we identified each organization, what we did is we mapped out the organizations of influence where we thought we had specialties and SMEs on our team where they can make meaningful, uh, meaningful progress into, right? You have to identify your strengths. Every SC team is wildly different, but we typically will have like areas of technical strength, areas of sales strength, those kinds of things, maybe industry strength where people came in from industry. Determine where and how you can add real value and recognize that most pre-sales teams are, are similar. So also ask outside your organization. So use, use organizations like pre-sales collective, events like this to connect and say, where are you strong? Where are you influencing? Okay. This is a slide that we used. And sorry, Tulsi and Jeff, if it gives you some PTSD, because this is not easy to do. Um, but this is a slide we used uh, to represent the year of the SE. We identified these organizations and these areas of uh, improvement. So we had sales, the SE organization, product, marketing, tech, and managers, because we didn't have much manager training. Um, and so we identified where we were going to go. We branded our year. Then we aligned strengths with councils. So what this means is you basically, again, you want to give something a name and a title, make it official. We created councils where we could establish influence. So we formed a sales enablement council, a marketing council. We, had, we formed an office of the CISO and, and, and some other councils, product SME groups, okay? And what this looked like is you would have a biweekly meeting with these organizations and you could basically influence and improve them. So we had a, bi, I, I had a biweekly meeting with the sales enablement team and sales enablement would say, hey, here's how we're gonna enable the sales team. And we would go, yeah, I, I don't know. Because uh, it wasn't working, you know, we, we, we found that like maybe some of the docs we were creating or the ways we would enable sales would be very different than their approach. We did this in marketing. We found that marketing really wanted our, in, our input. We started writing blogs. We started doing webinars. We started doing customer videos. And guess what? Those blogs were the highest, uh, highest uh, visited blogs on the website for many years to come. So whatever, what we found is whatever pre-sales did the blogs, 
or the webinars, they were the highest rated and the highest traffic uh, pieces of content on the website. It's just relevance. We created product SME groups. You know, who's the, who knows that product the best? We had eight products at the time. Um, some of them played in very different areas, all the way from, from networking to disaster recovery solutions. So very, very different kind of areas. And then we launched, um, we, we, we added ourselves to product launches, okay? I became the SE, the principal SE on a product launch for an Azure product. So I was basically influencing product market fit, product questionnaires, you know, really early funnel product launch type stuff. We also created a security and compliance council. Um, does ever, is anybody on the call get those questions from sales where they're like, hey, are we SOC 2 compliant? Or are, uh, do we, does this product meet HIPAA requirements? Uh, and you're like, dude, always, right, Ethan? Always. And, and you're like, yes, we, we do or, or we don't. And we have a document that'll tell you where we're compliant. But it always gets a step further, which is like, can this be configured in a HIPAA compliant manner, right? And that's the stuff that we didn't really know. And so we created sort of, we had some people involved and, and interested in security and compliance created a council. So we wanted to influence that. Focus on revenue, right? So uh, and anybody here who leads a team knows that uh, to get things like budget, headcount, et cetera, you got to tie it to some dollars, right? So we thought, okay, how do we influence and implement this so that we can tie it to dollars? What we did is we implemented customer nurture and enablement programming. Um, and, and this is more important than ever, which is my, my belief as tooling gets better and better. Okay. We're, we're on a, we're on an event with reprise. They have an amazing tool uh, that can help all go to market teams. Well, as these tools get better, uh, David just covered, he said, there's 30 of them. Uh, I don't think we're going to get less busy. My thought though, is that customer acquisition costs are rising. It's, it's more expensive and harder and harder than ever than, than ever to get a customer. And retention is also extremely hard to do because people are really comfortable with change right now. So the change cost, I remember back in the day, changing your CRM was like, no way, you're never going to get out of Salesforce. Guess what? We're all pretty used to it now. So as we implement tools to save us time, where do we put that effort? We put that effort in customer acquisition cost and retention. Now start strategically uh, influencing nurturing the customers, enabling the customers, keeping them enabled, land and expand. If you start to influence those two sides of the business as a solution consulting team, you're, you're above the rest and you are strategically helping the business. All right, that's a bit of a rant, but you get what I'm saying. Conduct loss deal analysis, so understand why we're losing. That's gonna make a big impact. A lot of people don't spend too much time on lost deals because, hey, that's the lost deal. We're gonna move on to the win, we're gonna win. Take that extra moment. Do SME reporting on revenue. So um, tie your product losses or feature function to some revenue. Just do some easy Salesforce reports or CRM supports, tying those things together, and then unify your demo platform. So this is this is what we did to, um, this was kind of like stage two, which is we expanded, we did the lost deal analysis. We started to enable our partners, customers, we started to unify technology and we started to tie the feature asks, gaps and releases to revenue. Expand influence. This is where you're gonna expand like your influence across the organization and competitive intelligence, comprehensive management training programs, technical certification tracks. And we actually created a new role called the technical account manager, which we didn't have. A lot of people already have them. We didn't have those. Uh, but we wanted to take care of the top customers, right? And so we just started doing it on, on our own. Uh, we didn't wait for sales to do it. So we started doing demo training and you can see this starts to get built out. So at the end of the year, there's a lot more data here. And then you're going to wrap it up. You're going to complete the year. So you're, you've basically completed a mission. And this is what it looked like at the end of the year. So literally within one year, we went from what was perceived as a more proactive team. And I wouldn't say we were all that we were all that inactive. It just was a perception problem. We created councils. We started working with other organizations more. We created new roles. We created, we put ourselves in product launches. Um, 
we actually sort of expanded our technical labs to let other people come in and experience the technology. All of a sudden, we were like really effective across the organization. And guess what? We got budget. So we doubled our team. We were a fast growing organization. We went from 250 million to 900 million in four years. Uh, but we doubled our team after this year. And I, I don't think we could have done it without tying ourselves to all of this stuff. Okay. Step two, we're going to rebrand our year. We're going to do it again and identify the orgs, right? This year was the alignment and scale. So 2022 was the year of alignment and scale. And this is our ability to basically say, all right, we've got all these things out there, all these initiatives, all of our SEs are now moving in these directions, but we need to scale this thing out. We need to make sure that it works. So we dug deeper. We're, we started to influence sales onboarding. Okay. How do we, on, we were onboarding tons of sellers. How did we get involved in enabling them? So again, our SME council or our sales enablement council started to actually do sales onboarding. We established what was called, it was originally called Chris's Corner because I started it, but I didn't, I, it just sounded weird when people were saying Chris's Corner. Uh, we called it SE Corner. On sales team calls every week, we would come into the sales team call. Like we were aligned, um, our alignment was regional sales director to SE manager about, I don't know, the ratio is like one to 15 or something. It was a, it was a high velocity deal uh, model. So there was a high ratio. Yes, you would join the regional sales director's weekly calls and they would give the best deal of the week and actually give some internal points awards. So you would actually come on and for five minutes and then you can give some market updates and things. We wanted to give the perception that we were alongside the regional sales direction, the regional sales director as their partner. We developed customer enablement series and we engaged with new offices called the office of the CISO and the office of the CTO. Again, this is kind of a council, but we were monthly meeting with executives now. And every month we were meeting with executives and, and we were actually educating them on the market, something we did not do a year before. Again, we're just expanding influence. We're not owning anything new, okay? There's popularity around ownership with pre-sales. Uh, I would argue uh, influence is just as important. So it's only influence. We're not owning anything yet. We're going to influence more revenue. We created a one-to-many demo series for a much broader reach because our process was really like a one-to-one -one process. We designed non-technical demos for SDRs and sales teams. That's where I wish we had some sort of demo automation tool uh, that would have sped that up immediately. But we had that we created that in-house. We started doing competitive tech teardowns. So we actually started, we actually rolled the CI department into the sales engineering department and we started doing competitive intelligence. And then we started making SE participation mandatory in the regional team QBRs. Super easy to do. The QBRs happen already. Let your SE sit on them. What we found is that, I mean, I learned a lot from, att from attending these QBRs. You find not only you learn a lot about the deals, but you understand like how the sales team's talking about them. And it was always obvious to me in the room when they're kind of representing a deal incorrectly, you know? So here's the map again. We just started doing more and more. We started to build this out. And in the management training, we started to be way more data-driven, okay? We were not using data appropriately, um, but at the beginning of this year, we're like, we're gonna get data right. So we just started using data and performance management a lot more. Scale. So this was when we restructured the management teams into strategic growth and emerging categories. We expanded influence across the whole customer life cycle. Um, so we started, like management started to get involved in that. And what I would say here is there's like, there's management tiers um, and there's about four management tiers. So one is people are on your team because it's assigned. They're on your team because you're their manager and they got assigned to you. The other um, is they're on your team because they want to be on your team. Okay. So they're not only just assigned. Now they're on your team because they're like, Hey, I, I like being on Rebecca's team. I like what she does. The third tier is they're on your team because of what you can do for them. Uh, I still carry this to this day. Anybody that works with me or for me or I work for, I'm doing stuff for them. I'm here for them. I'm here to listen to them. I'm here to make their career better. My job is to make you look good. That's my job. The second and the last and the, the hardest one to get if you're a leader 
is they're on your team for what you stand for and what you represent. So what do you stand for as a person? That gets deeper into a lot of things. Uh, that's hard to do. I, I, I don't know if I'm there, but um, when we started the restructure management and expand management, it actually, I think, affected the team a lot. We established sales partnership and CTO roles with the regional managers. So it was like the office of the CTO, but you were acting as the CTO. And we implemented the award for the qualified deal. And that was our qualification requirements. Okay. This is what the year starts to look like. Again, it's a lot of work. Okay. I'm not going to uh, try to say that this is uh, not an additional workload. It is. But as you can see, if you think about it and you do this over the course of a year, you're really just literally taking the stuff you're already doing and you're giving it titles, you're giving it purpose. You might already be helping sales teams, but call it something, right? Measure it. That's what influence is about. And I would say the implementation strategy here is where this is, this is I would say it's key from the very get-go. Um, you have to be extremely clear with your vision if you're rolling this out and why. Um, I talked to a leader a week ago who said, man, we, we need to prove our value to our CRO. And so I went through this with him and I said, okay, this is how I've done it before. And he said, yeah, my team is on board. And that's half the battle. I think you have to do a very good job at explaining the why behind you're going through this process because your team is going to experience change. Um, it's always better if your team feels that they have and they should really have influence over that change. So you're providing support, you're seeking clear buy-in from your stakeholders and those stakeholders ex also include product teams, sales enablement teams, marketing teams, you know, I remember um, we did this wrong. We 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 kind of stepped on our own toes when we inserted an SE into a product launch one time, and and it was because just the communication wasn't there. We didn't clearly state the need and the why, and so they thought. I, I think there were individuals in that program that thought we were trying to take it over, right? So clearly, seeking buy-in from those individuals you're creating councils for and that you're influencing is crucial. Um, the truth is, you can help everyone. Period. If you're in pre-sales, um, you know you can help almost every every department there, right? Um, so just be clear on that. Encourage gradual transitions and prioritize the responsibilities. This is why I took you through the journey and went through each slide, is it's got to be gradual. You have to kind of gradually start to expand your influence. Adjust the workloads and provide necessary tools, training, and mentoring, Okay. The tooling space has gotten way better and ex exponentially better. As I said before, as the tooling space and AI really start to affect go-to-market, and I think I think it's not just a pre-sales tool. It's top of funnel, bottom of funnel, the whole thing. Um, maybe making an investment in a tool so you can get some of these things done is way cheaper than hiring a person, right? So invest in those necessary tools, um, invest in the training, the mentoring, take that extra time. It's going to help you a ton when you try to go through this. And then recognize the progress. So this is like absolutely key. If you start a council and you see a couple of meetings, attend the meetings if you're, if you're a manager. Uh, take the notes if you're running the council. Take those notes, bullet point them, put them in your you know, monthly team meeting. Try to get something highlighted in your all hands. This is what the SE team's doing. So continu continuously recognize progress. Like I said at the very beginning of this, who's ever put a lot of work into something and not had the uh, had the recognition as an SE? It's important that you keep uh, you keep driving this. Okay. Um, and then I would say recognize and implement those changing changes slowly. So I'd like to go to any questions. I know a lot is a lot have come in, and I know there's a lot of comments. Uh, Marina, thank you so much. The framework needs to be taken and applied to all orgs. Uh, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> That's why I'm here. So I really, really, really appreciate that. Uh, Jeff, what was the year of 2023? Um, I think that was the year everything changed because we did such a good job. We got bought. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. And and Ronan on comp plans, you're 
Correct. And Jeff, you're laughing. I get it. Um, a critical piece here, I didn't think I'd have enough time, is that I created a new career model framework. Okay. Now, this career model framework included a whole new set of roles and responsibilities and paths for career growth. Importantly, paths for senior solution engineers that aren't interested in management, okay? The moment you start influencing go-to-market, the moment you start influencing deals and revenue, et cetera, et cetera, that's when your leadership team needs to be proving that with data to their executives and getting uh, a little bit of pump, right? That's, that's why it should be uh, uh, recognized. So yeah, Jeff, you just submitted it. That's, that's a great point. You've got to do that. Uh, I'm happy to share. I have a career model framework too, if anybody's interested. Oh, it looks a lot like mine. Yeah, I was going to say, you probably stole mine. Uh, I'm happy to share that with anybody who's interested. So please just send me, send me a message on Slack or LinkedIn. Um, I have a really nice sort of, uh, I think a general one you could apply to your organization.